Hello, welcome back to an episode of History Hack. You've got me and Merrin today. Very exciting. Love working with Merrin. But Merrin, you've got an interesting guest for us. Tell us who we got on. I have another Alex for us to talk to. Alex, tell me how to pronounce your surname. Is it Christophe or Christophe? It's Christophe. It's Alex Christophe. And Alex is a writer, an editor, and an award winning author who has written, um, how would we describe it? I know that you've described it yourself as burying your heart in Dostoevsky's fiction. Um, what we're going to be doing is exploring um, how you've put the book together and why people should read it, because it gives some fascinating insights into that time, the time um, and the evolution of literature and how society and literature kind of worked in harmony. So as a biography, Alex, do you want to um, take us into, I don't know, just, just exploring how the book is put together because it's put together with anecdotes and, and interesting yeah. slants on his life. And perhaps tell us a bit about where we are and what's going on in the 1800s. Yeah, so I, I, um, I sort of decided to put this book together to explore kind of what it was like to be Dostoevsky I think that there's been a lot of really really good writing in in the last um, few years about Dostoevsky's contribution to philosophy and to novels and to literature um, but I, I also think he just just as a human being he had an absolutely fascinating life and actually the more you learn about his life the more you realize that there are these little kind of pieces of uh, of his own life that have informed his fiction and it really felt to me like there was an interesting thing you could do there. So I, um, I, I found this sort of way of chopping in bits of his letters, which, which of course people do for biographies, but also bits of his fiction uh, and, and other things in his writing that, that seemed kind of to throw a new light onto his life, um, to, to make it feel as personal as possible, I suppose. It, you know, he, he had an idea in uh, his later life that he, he wanted to write a memoir but he never got round to it and I really like this idea of trying to sort of reconstruct in some way that that kind of intimate feeling of the memoir. It's a really, um, really good approach. Do you, do you want to tell us a little bit about where he's living and what's going on there? Yeah it, it's also a fascinating time for Russian society because it, it's so he was born um, just a few years before uh, the Decemberist revolt which was in 1825 December 1825 um, there was a sort of succession crisis. Um, the, the previous Tsar had died and a new Tsar, Nicholas I, was going to come to the throne. And all of the nobility were um, convinced this was the moment for them to kind of rise up and, and they, they, they decided this was the moment they, they were going to ask for sort of slightly more almost pro-democratic reforms, liberal reforms. One of the things they wanted to do was um, to liberate the serfs you still had a, a sort of version of almost feudal society where um, the peasant class were kind of tied to a piece of land. If you sold the land, you sold the serfs. So it was a, you know, it wasn't quite the same as slavery. It was practiced in the West, but it, in, in practice, it was a, a kind of slavery. And uh, a lot of the liberal um, nobles wanted to change that system. N Nicholas I responded on the first day of, um, of his accession by, um, rounding up about 36 cannons and firing them at the 3,000 nobles who had gathered in Senate Square and his relation his relationship with liberals yeah it wasn't great it wasn't a great start to his uh his um leadership of the country and he wasn't subsequently as you might imagine very fond of liberals so that was the the early part of uh, his life um and when he as he became an adult uh, there were some signs that maybe things might be getting a little bit more relaxed. Um, but then, of course, there were these revolutions all across Europe in 1848. Um, and that made the Tsar very worried for his position. And uh, and he, he kind of had a, a serious crackdown. So that was kind of the first half of Russia was overshadowed by that. The first half of um, Dostoevsky's life, Russia was overshadowed by um the, the kind of trials and tribulations of Nicholas the first and then in the second half you had um, who, uh, the, the Tsar was called the Tsar liberator Alexander the um, second who did make some steps to kind of reform the way that government worked and to free uh, free up the serfs uh, it wasn't 
it wasn't a sort of unmitigated success, unfortunately. And there were a lot of socialists and revolutionaries um, who had other designs on the Russian state. So it was a, it was a pretty turbulent period, but it's absolutely fascinating that this period that Dostoevsky led through 1821 to 1881, it's, it's really the difference between a, a kind of feudal society and a society that's on the brink of, uh, you know, discussing ideas around com a communist revolution. Obviously, that didn't happen for a while yet, but the set, the scene was already being set in the 80s. So moving away from the idea of people as chattels and more into community. And mm, more into absolutely. Respect, more into respect for each other. Yeah. yeah, huge disagreements over how to how to have and form a good community. Um, but but most of the people, even if they disagreed strongly with one another, they were they were all talking in really explicit terms about you know what makes a good society. Exploring and it kind that of framework, yeah, exploring yeah. ideas and pushing back. And, and that I think we'll, we'll come to this in a bit. But that comes to the idea of Dostoevsky himself actually looking at these ideas and surfacing them as options through his literature. Mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I find um, this time period really interesting because the Russian Empire wasn't as stable. You've got uprisings, like, for example, in, in the Polish sector, Poland, I say yeah. that very liberally. You know, you've got uprisings happening left, right and centre, people wanting independence. And it is just such a mess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a, what, what we would describe in 2021 as a hot mess. It's, it, I mean, that there's what's really weird about, Dostoevsky's um, version of nationalism is that actually on paper he's almost exactly identical to the kind of views and beliefs of some of the Polish nationalists. The only difference is the Polish nationalists were working against the Russians <laughs> and the you know the Russians was were were you know trying to keep Poland as as a um, a sort of client state of of the Russian Empire. So um, sadly, you particularly Joseph Conrad's dad was. Um, a leading figure in in the Polish nationalist um, movement, and and they actually loved so many of the same things. But if you put them in a room, they probably wouldn't have got on. When do Poles and Russians? Sorry to interrupt, Ryan. When do Poles and Russians mm. ever get on? Well, yes, that's that, that's <laughs> probably a, a whole podcast right there. <laughs> Sorry, so, Marin. It's all right, no problem at all. So, so let's have a look at Fyodor. Fyodor. Yeah. I say Fyodor. Fyodor. Let's have a look at Fyodor himself and understand a bit about um, the family he was born into. Because then, um, what what little I remember, he was um, he went through the military engineering institute, so he could have had a very different career. Uh, was tell, tell us a little bit about he, him as a person. Yeah, he was his dad. His father was a um, a, a surgeon, and he worked incredibly hard to basically get. Um, he, he was awarded an, uh, a, the lowest rung, basically, on the hereditary nobility. So he was like the 14th most important rung on the, on the ladder when it came to the gentry. It, basically, all it conferred on you, um, it certainly wasn't respect, but it did allow you to own land. So they saved up all their money over the course of years and bought a tiny, tiny estate numbering 100 serfs. That's how the, the size of estates were counted in those days. If you, for comparison, someone like Tegenev would have had literally thousands of serfs on, on his estate. So this, you know, they bought basically a, a, a kind of a barn um, with a, a bit a of woodland small attached. Hold, a small holding with some people attached. It was, yes. yeah, I mean, it, there, was, there was a sort of village, a hamlet um, yeah. Yeah. nearby, but it, but it was a, it was pretty down at hill. But Dostoevsky loved it and he spent a lot of time there. One of the running themes in Dostoevsky's life is that he was very, very unlucky. And, and that started early on when he was about 10. This estate burned to the ground and um, never really recovered. His mother died when he was 15. Um, and actually, his, he, after he was sent to this engineering academy that you mentioned in St. Petersburg, his father died. Um, in the, the best case scenario is that he died of alcoholism. The worst case scenario is that he's potentially murdered by his serfs because um, he was deeply unpopular. He used to, uh, he was very violent. He, he used to take surf girls into his household at far too young an age and was an all round unpleasant man. Um, so Dostoevsky kind of found himself basically orphaned in St. Petersburg, knowing he wanted to be a novelist, um, but sort of 
having just qualified as a military engineer. I mean, I think anyone who knows even a tiny bit about Dostoevsky is kind of terrified, would be terrified at the idea that he'd be an engineer. That there's a um, a Russian lecturer in America called Erwin Wa who who makes my favorite joke about Dostoevsky is like, who would want to walk across a bridge that Dostoevsky built? You know, um, if anyone's seen the way he plots his novels, but um, he's, he's yeah, not he pretty... man, he's not a man for whom the stars have aligned, really, is he? No, it's not the most auspicious start, um, but he, he really loved reading. He devoured books. He knew very early on, he was very clear about where he felt his destiny lay. And in some ways, his father's death, it, though it might have caused him kind of guilt, it, it, it certainly freed him up to pursue what he, he knew he wanted to. He, he sat there writing a novel basically in penury. He was kind of, he couldn't afford to, all the money that he, he was supposed to have set aside for buying new boots he spent at the library and, um, and also billiards rooms and things like that. He was always terrible with money, but he wrote this, this novel, Poor Folk, and that propelled him straight to, to fame in Russian literary circles so he, pretty much overnight. So he was using his personal experience to actually develop the themes in that book, the gambling and the financial decline. Uh, that poor folk was set in um it was kind of across a court there was like a love story across a courtyard a young woman who was had been sort of abandoned a bit by her um by her family and an, an old man who administrator who kind of could barely afford um couldn't really afford to have to, to offer his hand in marriage to anyone but he he was trying to sort of help her out because he loved her and it's, it's kind of a doomed love story set in this echelon of Russian society no one was really writing about at that time. And that was part of the reason why, why it was picked up so quickly. This famous critic called Belinsky saw it and he initially, he, he immediately recognised that, you know, this was the sort of social realist novel that he'd been desperately hoping someone would write about Russia. You know, it wasn't a book about the gentry. This was a book about people who were struggling to get by in the heart of the city um, the, these real lives that weren't being captured in literature up to that time. Who, just, just a quick one, who would have been reading Poor Folk? Is it a fair assumption that if, if we sort of categorise them as gentry and serfs, that mm. serfs them, themselves would not have had the access to this literature and it was a gentry occupation reading? Yeah, yeah, literacy was um, not widespread at all. It, you know, if you had an education um then it, it you know it was because you were one of that class of people um the gentry was kind of broader in in some ways than um you know it is in contemporary england you know it's not it's not a few hundred people but it's a tiny proportion of the pu of the russian public you know you had kind of a population I, I can't remember off the top of my head but i think let's say it's around sort of three million people and you had a few thousand really in in the intelligentsia who were from these famous families who were kind of running the show. So it was about talking to the other liberal gentry. Um, people would subscribe to these thick monthly journals that were kind of as thick as books. And that was really the one of the big ways that people could conduct their public life. Um, you know, the journals were, were almost the equivalent of like, you know, Twitter and the news for us, it was where all of really? these public conversations were happening and, and fiction was a huge part of that. So, so when Poor Folk came out, this surfaced something that against the backdrop of change, it surfaced a whole new tranche of ideas then about how yeah, life I mean, lived. It, it was about, it was really about showing what life was really like in Russia, um, kind of almost getting over the there'd been a period of sort of romanticism and then these kind of fun, slightly absurd stories by Gogol, which did start to deal with people who were a bit downtrodden, but mainly as figures of fun, really. They, you know, things didn't end well for them and it was all done in a kind of, and then he died lol. That was essentially like the ending of most of the Gogol stories. So, it was, you know, th this was something that hadn't quite, hadn't really come it, it, its time had come, but no one had really written that book yet. And that was what um, this critic, Belinsky, was really excited because he felt this was a new um, a new episode. It in was Russian different. Literature. It was completely yeah. different. 
yeah, it, it, no, nobody had tackled this before. The, the difference was that he was writing in a different way. Yeah. Mm. Um, so he got into that circle, um, that this kind of literary salon that had developed around Belinsky um, and, and annoyed them all surprisingly quickly and didn't write a follow-up that they liked. He wrote a sort of slightly more Gogol style kind of absurd thing that they were all like, oh, what the hell is this? And so he fell out, he fell out with them in about, I mean, so to give you some context, Poor Folk was published in January of 1846. The double, this follow-up was published in February. By that time, he was already falling out with them. Um, so his, his period of literary stardom was really quite brief. <laughs> yeah, in his youth. He had a comeback, as we know. So part of the problem with, well, being different uh, and breaking boundaries and expanding literary views is encouraging people to think. Perhaps it becomes much harder for the powers to be to ensure consistent sub subservience order. And that led to him being arrested for belonging to a literary group that discussed mm -hmm. banned books. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so after he, he'd fallen out with this, this Belinsky circle, and he got invited uh, to a different circle that was, you know, pretty much the same on the surface. It, it looked pretty similar as kind of, you know, liberals drinking wine and chatting about things that they couldn't, you know, the nice thing about these literary salons was it would happen around someone's house. You know, it wasn't something you, you weren't going to get arrested for talking about what, what do we do about the serfs? Because it wasn't a part of the public conversation. It was behind closed doors. Um, but this group was much more, um, kind of overtly challenging uh, the way that things were run. And one of the things they did, uh, they, they had one of their dinners where they would, you know, they'd get drunk and someone would start playing the Marseillaise on the piano and they'd all have lots of fun. One of these dinners, Dostoevsky stood up and he read a letter out that had been banned from um, Belinsky to Gogol, basically talking about, we, we really need to solve this problem, you know, governments, getting um, stuck, we need to solve this problem we, and liberalize uh, government, we need to free the serfs. And uh, he, he was kind of accusing Gogol of, of, of not writing about these important things. Um, just for reading out that letter, it turned out, you know, everyone thought they were safe at this, uh, at this private dinner, but actually one of the people at the dinner was a, an undercover police agent. Um, so he was arrested and put in a fortress and interrogated a lot and eventually um he was subjected to a sort of grisly mock execution on a public square and sent to siberia Rose. i mean just just mentioning for the fact that i think literary salons should make an instant an immediate comeback because oh, the yeah. idea of hunkering down in somebody's front room with a couple of bottles of wine picking the hang on a minute i think this is this is called down the pub on history hack what we yep. do is we get, to get together with a couple of bottles of wine and go, yep, yeah, let's explore these ideas and just rip them to pieces and come back again. But we don't always have mm. undercover policemen in the room, not to my knowledge anyway. But you, you said that there was a mock execution. He was sent to mm. Siberia, is that right? What would that have been like? Uh, it was pretty, so, so the mock execution was, you know, it wasn't just uh, a case of going through the motions. They, they lined them up. They, he was there were six of them there he was in he was number five and they tied the first three to the to posts put a big wood um you know a white hood over their eyes lined up a firing squad you know they told them effectively they got to the point where they'd cocked their rifles and then a man read in uh, rode in galloping on a horse from uh, straight from the Tsar's palace with a um a note saying that he'd granted them their lives but it was you know they, they waited until the very last moment. These people were, were pretty much as certain as a person could be that, that they were going to die. So, and that was so, obviously incredibly yeah, traumatizing. Psychological abuse. I mean, was there a purpose yeah. to it? Was there, it, was it, was, it, it was an example. He, he was, you right. know, he was really scared about these 1848 revolutions. Right. He was worried that he might lose his grip on, on the liberal intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. uh, so he picked a bunch of people who looked like you know, they might cause trouble in future and, and decided to make an example of them. One of them was was Dostoevsky. So he was sentenced to um, four years hard labour. He was in a prison in Omsk where it was 
routinely minus 40 degrees Celsius. And all, he, all they gave him was a sort of like a sheepskin jacket. Um, the One of the descriptions he gives of his time in prison is that the there was glass, you know, small glass windows in, in the barracks, but the ice on them on the inside of the glass was an inch thick. Um, this was not a particularly comfortable experience, you know. He's, he's got this incredibly Dantean, disgusting um, description of what the bathhouses were like with this sort of sludge all over the floor and people, you know, people's chains getting tangled up and it's just honestly like a vision of hell. And that, you know, hard labor consisted at that time of breaking up timber, pounding alabaster, um, doing doing kind of very, very menial manual work. Um, and the vast majority of the people there were, were the peasant class who wouldn't give him the time of day. Um, the, 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 you know, the irony is he was in there for trying to sort of liberate them. Um, but they, as far as most of them were concerned, he was one of the, you know, one of the upper class that were part of the problem. Um, so he had a pretty good time. I'm surprised he survived. I mean, you're just describing all of this and all that's going through my head, because obviously I, I work in the Second mm. World War, so all I'm thinking is gulag, gulag, yeah. gulag, and I'm surprised he survived such hard menial labour. It's it's unbelievable he's managed to get yeah. through it. Yeah, and he did spend, I mean, he spent some of the time he was there in hospital. Um, he, the, the nutri- I think part of the reason that, part of what made it really hard was the lack of adequate nutrition um is i mean knowing he survived it it's easy for me to sort of play it up in the book and make it he kind of makes a bit of fun out of it almost um when he writes about it but you know they'd have this sort of vegetable soup and the only protein really was these little black cockroaches that <laughs> found their way into it and you could if you if you could get hold of money which by was by no means certain um you might be able to buy a bit of beef to eat every now and then but but basically you were just given gruel um and then sent out into the cold to break up barges it's it's just it's horrific and for somebody who was um clearly of a creative bent who had a literary mind whose mind whose Mm. imagination was always wanting to pour out onto a page it the the deprivation of um well culture of anything must have been in some ways not worse, but a, a compound factor in actually his imprisonment and, and his exile. Mm. So, so let's, let's bring him out of exile. He, come, he, he does come out of exile. He comes back to writing, doesn't he? But he doesn't necessarily come back to having a wonderful, rosy life. No. he. I mean, so he had to spend... Um, he, after you get out of your hard labour, you don't go straight back in society. You, you're still in Siberia and mm. he, he had to be a private in the army. Um, having already previously been an um, an officer engineer, um, so he the the only real bright spot. I mean, it, he had a pretty terrible time there. He wasn't he was officially not allowed to write at that time, but he did meet a, a woman he fell in love with. Um, he he'd actually met her through her husband at the time. She she was married to a Scandal. a drunken excise officer called Isayev. Scandal. I, it was very scandalous and they had um, my favorite little tryst that they had was um, he got posted somewhere else. So she was going to go, you know, hundreds of miles away. And on the night they were going to leave uh, him and his mate kind of they, they knew the husband liked to drink. So they brought basically unlimited champagne, waited until he was knocked out. And then they had a sort of a, a bit, bit of a parting moment under the tree before they sort of hefted the oh, husband back in the woo! carriage. Oh, dangerous. Very, really dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Dangerous. Um, very saucy. Uh, but they, I mean, they eventually, Is- Isaiah had, was in very bad health and he, he died, um, unfortunately. Um, there, he spent a long time kind of chasing after her and she wouldn't marry him till he got promoted and so on. Eventually, they, they did get married. They didn't make each other very happy, even on from the wedding night basically onwards um he had an epileptic fit on his wedding night and she was furious with him for not having been completely candid with her about his health and um yeah i mean they 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 didn't uh i think they probably the happiest that they were was during the the chase and then at the point where they were married they almost began to realize that they'd made a mistake but 
life comes um, full circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, not, it's often it's often the case. And he represented this, didn't he, in um, crime crime and punishment? No, in oh, there was a, yeah. So there's a book called, injured. Yes, that's right. In and injured, there's this sort of love triangle. And he, I mean, there was, so when she moved to this other town hundreds of miles away, there was a teacher there called Vergunov who uh, was totally stupid by all accounts, but really nice and quite hunky and younger and healthier than Dostoevsky. Um, she would have had, you know, just as little kind of prospects with him, but, but I think they kind of got on pretty well. And there's this bizarre sort of three or four months where, Dostoevsky's trying to coach Verganov out of marrying Maria because it would be very bad for both of them. And you suspect he has a slightly ulterior motive here, but it's, uh, the whole thing has this kind of weird uh, codependency going on. Um, you could, I mean, th this bit of his life was like a, it, 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 it reads like a novel. It's just love triangles all over the place. <laughs> well, so she's not her, uh, well, she's not his only love interest. There's uh, three women in your book. Um, can you yep. tell us about Polina? Not Elena, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Polina and Anna. <laughs> yeah, so um, when he eventually got back to St. Petersburg, he was allowed to resume his literary career. And, and what, you know, one of the things that actually made him kind of famous again, really, was um, this thinly veiled memoir of his time in prison called Notes from the House of the Dead. Um, and he, at this point... Maria was very ill. She she had consumption and it was pretty clear she wasn't um, going to live very much longer. Um, and, and by that point, as I say, they were kind of estranged already. Um, his star was rising and, and he'd become a bit of a hero to this young generation of students who were coming through, who were really looking for um, heroes who, who had, uh, you know, Russia was beginning to liberalise. So this was the time of the new star that we were talking about. And uh, and people were looking for people who had actually sort of basically stood up for what they believed in in the previous period. And Dostoevsky had obviously, you know, suffered the last 10 years of his life for his beliefs. So, you know, ideas were, were really life and death to Dostoevsky. That's why it feels like that in his writing sometimes. And one of these students was a young woman called Polina, who um, was very forceful and outspoken and uh, and also beautiful and flirtatious. And they very much hit us off. He published one of her stories in his journal and they kind of went went from there. She wanted, she was really uh, insistent that he marry her and, and he didn't want to divorce Maria in, in her dying months, which I think is is fair. Um, but he agreed to meet her in, in Paris that summer. Um, unfortunately, he was a bit, he was kind of waylaid by um, some business arrangements and paying back a loan and by the time he got there, she had fallen in love with a Spanish medical student called Salvador. So uh, didn't didn't end well, Polina. Oh bless! Never mind, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Never mind. Eh? <laughs> this is what happens when you as fish in the tree. In the tree, plenty more fish in the sea. Sorry, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Not many more fish in the tree. No. <laughs> so, so that was Polina. Yes, that was Polina. Okay. And the third um, woman who, who appears in your book is Anna. Now, yes. so, so now one of these women actually sort of works in tandem with Dostoevsky, doesn't it, to, to ensure mm. that, that his legacy is possible, that, that his literature can survive, even though people are still a little bit critical of it. And yeah. one of the other women, you have to explain which, which way around it is, one of the other women is involved with plan to assassinate the Tsar. That so that was Polina. Polina was uh, super interested in all these ideas of like, you know, bubbling around socialism and what they called nihilism at the time, which is basically a sort of, you know, a atheist socialist utopia and that kind of thing. And um, yeah, when, one of the days when they were very disconsolate and she'd found out Salvador was cheating on her and she was having a bad day and she sort of looked out across the Paris rooftops and said, you know, I had a very dark thought the other day and D Dostoevsky eventually weed was out of her. He, he thinks, oh God, she, you know, she's thinking she's going to stab Salvador or something like that. She goes, no, if I, you know, all men are the same. If I'm going to kill anyone, why not kill the Tsar? You know, he's as bad as the rest of them. And that, that was pretty much, you know, bearing, bearing in mind that Dostoevsky had spent his, the best years of his adult life in Siberia for saying a lot less. I think that he was very, very freaked out of this and didn't take it very well. 
But, but it's an indication, isn't it, that, that we've moved in a period of what, maybe 20, 25 years from a point at which the concept of um, changing society and mm. actually removing serfdom as a concept has has matured into an environment in which people now feel they can express that kind of sentiment, even if it's behind closed doors. Mm. So, so this yeah, is absolutely. A, it's a hockey stick of of change in the way that um, they are living and, and the way that their views are being put onto paper. So just yeah. Dostoevsky's writing reflects that, doesn't it? He, the the yeah. way that he starts writing um, his his first titles reflects the fact that we need change and then he goes through a period of changes happening and then if we look at the end of his legacy some of his writing is very reflective about the potential now that we can afford to stand up we can survive mm -hmm. we can have been through that experience in Siberia and, and we merit coming to the table and now discussing our own future. Yeah I mean he so he saw huge potential in the throughout his life, even in his older years, he was absolutely fascinated by this young generation. And I think he really wanted to sort of channel the energy into positive change. And one of the things he was terrified about was that it might somehow falter by going off course by people um, being kind of being kind of seduced by dangerous ideas about, you know, crime and punishment is a story about a young student who thinks He's completely figured out all these theories about the world and then he's done all the maths and he's realised, OK, if I just beat this old woman over the head with an axe, I can make the world better. And sort of according to his equations, that should be correct. But just on a human level, it doesn't work. You know, there's no the, the problem with that, with these, you know, utilitarianism in this case. The problem is that it doesn't take into account humans and human feeling and compassion and he sort of you know Dostoevsky's coming from a, a position as a you know as a Christian I think that he felt that what was missing from some of these ideas was a, a sense of fellow feeling and, and you know brotherhood um, so that he he really wanted to engage with this generation and and I think he wanted to sort of channel it towards uh, a, a happier society and and away from a what he saw as the kind of coming violent revolution, which unfortunately he was then correct about. Didn't happen in his lifetime, but it did, did happen. So, I mean, let, let's look at that society then, because he, in the latter stages of his life, he wasn't very well. Yeah. Um, he, I mean, I think the list, the, I think possibly on your website, you, or one of the reviews of the book, there's a list of everything he was suffering from. This was not yeah. a well guy. How he ever got up in the mornings and went, I'm going to write really well today. I have no idea. My, I mean, bladder infections, emphysema, hemorrhoids, epilepsy, you name it, poor yeah. but, but in in being mentally prepared to, to write, and as writers, we, we know that some days, there are some days when you just don't write really well, but the quality of what he was writing certainly as he matured is is i mean it, it's revered now in some regards what kind of environment was he having to write in can we imagine him in a dark you know rooftop study writing away by hand you know i, I put my hands on the keyboard then writing <laughs> by hand or was he on a chaise long writing what kind of environment was he creating these these titles when it came to crime and punishment, you know, there's a scene where Raskolnikov hasn't eaten for ages and he's kind of getting delirious and keeps seeing things that aren't there. And he's in, you know, famously in his garret, you know, it's a brilliant scene, very evocative, like oddly lifelike. And the reason is part, he wrote part of that while he had gambled away all his money in Wiesbaden. He didn't have any, he didn't know anyone in the city, uh, you know, he, he was basically going out at 3 p.m. from his hotel room every day and uh and like basically hiding the fact from the hotel staff that he hadn't eaten it, i think he went three days just drinking tea um and you know they were getting increasingly annoyed and wouldn't press his shirts because he wasn't paying his hotel bill <laughs> and he was he was he, he was kind of sending letters off to increasingly sort of distant acquaintances to try to get some money off someone you know he, he even sent a letter to polina having kind of already fallen out with her 
sent a letter to Alexander Herzen, the socialist guy exiled in London who he'd met like once. I mean, it was really, really awful. <laughs> so that's why, you know, that kind of comes through so strongly in crime and punishment. Later on, I mean, after he met um, Anna, who became his second wife, he uh, they had a period where they were basically their exiles in in Europe. If he went back to Russia, he'd just be chucked in prison. So he was kind of moving around Europe and and gambling a lot. And they they had a, a less stable life than they'd have liked. But it wasn't it wasn't hand to mouth in that way. Uh, he still had a bit of income from his writing, but that was kind of while he was writing The Idiot. And then his last couple of books, actually, in the last few years of his life, he was super popular. They started publishing their own editions of his popular works that he'd already done. Um, he had a, a, a monthly journal of his own called A Writer's Diary, which he was publishing directly to his, you know, direct to consumer kind of thing. It was really innovative at the time and incredibly popular. Um, so by the end of his life, you know, he was doing pretty well by all accounts. And, you know, he, he went from being a, I, I, I don't know if he's the only person ever, but he's the only person I've come across who went from being a Siberian convict to being invited to dine with the Tsar at the end of his life. That's no mean feat. What, um, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm jumping forward here slightly. Where do we get um, this account of the dinner from? There must be a, there must be a, um, a record of that somewhere. Yeah, he, um, so basically he's, he, he, um, got introduced to a guy called Pobodonostsev, who um, was tutor to the Tsaroviches, the young... Um, get, the young... get an extra point if you can spell that, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you can spell it in Cyrillic, then you're basically a scholar. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, this, this guy was sort of super conservative and actually really, really enjoyed Dostoevsky's novels and thought there was great wisdom in them. He loved the way he was kind of blending Christian traditions with Russian traditions and... Um, and thought that he, he had a lot to teach the young, you know, Tsars to be basically, and the Grand Dukes. Um, so he brought him in really to sort of meet with them and be a bit of a, one of the people, one of the many people in the court who was kind of providing a bit of a moral education to them, I suppose. Um, but he wasn't very good at observing court etiquette. So he would, he, he would kind of just chat to the Tsar as if he was another person without, uh, without giving him the official names and things. He, he, he forgot to do that thing where you um, back out of the room and don't show them your back. Uh, there was one time where he was talking with a young Tsarina and uh, he was making a point. He was so um, keen to make his point and for her not to get away. Uh, he, he was sort of talking at her. And um, I mean, he, he, he didn't have the best social graces at the best of times, but this one's particularly bad. He's sort of talking at her in this kind of blizzard of speech. And um, at the end of it all, she was kind of slightly crying and he realised that he'd been holding on to her coat button the entire time. He'd been basically grabbing her by the coat, which is not really what you're supposed to do with the royals. But um, not, not, he not got away to, with it because he was just yeah, asking. Not, not had to make friends and influence people, is it? But, <laughs> no. this, is, but this isn't unusual for, and I'm going to be, make, make a huge generalism here that I don't, yeah, I'm confident about this one social skills for writers for authors it's not something they're known for so if if we think about the way that the imagination ends up being poured onto the page it's often mm. at the cost of those people having not being so, you know, socially inept but there's a refined element of their character that perhaps isn't as you know geared to oh i've got to spend 25 minutes talking to somebody nicely you know mm. so, well i suppose uh, you know the the really good writers, the, the people that we think of as reaching that standard of literature is all about actually challenging the way that we live our lives, challenging society and social norms and yeah. the way that we, the way things have always been done. Is yeah. that, is, is that just, should we inherit that uncritically? But I think, I think, you know, niceties are about observing those social norms. So in some ways, I guess it's not surprising. And there's a really good quote in Crime and Punishment, which um, to the effect that anyone who thinks up a new idea is effectively a, a criminal because by creating a, you know, by creating a new condition, but a new law, you're violating the old one. You know, it, if you think about something like serfdom, you could look back in the 1860s and say, oh, yeah, of course, abolish serfdom. Ten years before that, it was a crime to say so. 
Um, so, so actually, you, you don't necessarily, society doesn't necessarily reward you for being an innovative thinker or for being ahead of your time. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, today's heroes are yesterday's criminals. Oh, I like that. Today's heroes are yesterday's criminals. <gasps> I, should, I should write that one down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> okay. So on this podcast, we are sticklers for talking about sources and, and where you actually go and do your research. We, we absolutely love to hear this kind of stuff. I mean, how far did you have to go to find these sources and what kind of sources did you end up using for this? I, I built the book out of um, mainly primary sources. So if you look in the note in the citations of my book, it's mainly Dostoevsky's letters, his complete letters, his novels, um, and then contemporaneous sources like Anna, his second wife, wrote. Um, she wrote a set of memoirs that were kind of totally authorised and, and kind of published and palatable, but she, she based them off of some shorthand diaries she'd taken at the time, kind of day by day, which were a bit more candid and, and took ages to decipher because the type of stenography she used to use is like no one does it anymore. Um, so they were this kind of cryptographic mystery for a long time. Um, so things like that, th there's a really, really great book, which I'd recommend to anyone who's studying Dostoevsky in um, the UK, called the Dostoevsky Archive by Peter Sekarin, which gathers together loads of little um, bits of oral history, um, bits of testimony that might have been uh, missed elsewhere. Some of it is, is things that are kind of quite well known. Other bits, I found it an account in there that I just absolutely love. I was trying to find a, a good example of, because I it, it's clear when you research Dostoevsky how much he loved his children. Um, but just to say so is kind of dry and, and I wanted to find a good example of, of his love in action, you know. And there's a great uh, account in there of him playing this game where he'd put all his children on on little stools and tell them they were, they were on ice flows and he dressed up as a polar bear and he would, you know, he was going around the living room on all fours, threatening to gobble them up. And um, it's just lovely. And I haven't, I don't, I haven't seen that account in, in another book. Um, think, there's a, what, yeah, it's really lovely. It, um, it, it, it gives us a real insight to him as um, not, not as, um, yeah, it gives us an insight to him as a human being, somebody who's actually mm. really quite, quite sensitive in a way. To, yeah. to interaction. This is clearly something, this is clearly a book that um, reveals something, not just about the person, but also about um, the, the man inside the man, the, the abil his ab ability and capability to, to create literature. And even if we think that Dostoevsky's titles are a little bit hardcore, I think that a lot of our listeners would very much enjoy reading your book because it will help them to Thank understand you. the author as well as the literature that he actually brought into the world. So thank you very much for joining us today. Well, tell us what's next for you. Is it something else on the horizon? Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, not the obvious next, uh, next step for um, on paper, but I, I'd love to, to write about Cyprus. Um, it's where my dad's from. It's a fascinating island and it's got, it's kind of sits at the intersection of so much interesting history because it's obviously the kind of meeting point between three different continents so um that's going to be my next big project that sounds very interesting i do hope you'll come back to us and talk to come back and talk to us about it even in mid you know while you're halfway through it if you find find out that you're exploring different avenues of the way different parts of history came together we'd love to hear more about it alex yeah i'd love to thank you so much that's all right thank you it's been a real pleasure talking to you Ladies Cheers. and gentlemen, don't forget to head towards our bookshop and you'll be able to grab a copy of Alex's book. Thank you so much. You can help us at History Hack by joining us via Patreon. It takes quite a lot of effort and a lot of work of quite a big team now to keep us going. And so if you could donate as little as £3 a month, it would be massively appreciated by all of us. There's different levels because Princess Marcus has set it all up with uh, varying rewards and things. So do have a look. Do join us. There's uh, an exclusive Facebook group as well and you can be part of all of it. When our guests join us to talk about their work in their new book, 
the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book.